I'm honored to welcome our presenter for this evening, Mark Shepard. For more than 20 years, Mark has been raising grass-fed and chestnut-finished hogs in a diverse polyculture system that includes perennial forages available from May to October. This includes currants, mulberries, cherries, hazelnuts, apples, and hearty finish on chestnuts. We're going to learn about that process and all the nitty-gritty um, here this evening. So, Mark, your mic should be live and ready to go. Hey there. How's it going, everybody? Thanks for having me on, Kelly. Great. Take it away. Hey, take it away. All right. <laughs> well, um, probably we'll be going over an hour. I've got about 72 hours worth of uh, material here, but I'll go pretty fast. A lot of it's just uh, some simple bullet points. But what you have there in front of you is an era photograph of New Forest Farm, southwest Wisconsin. This is his 24th season uh, in operation, and uh, you'll learn more about it as we go along. And my slides are not advancing. Okay, there we go. Come on, advance. There we go. This is the uh, website for the farm. It's uh, rather thin, meaning there's not a lot of uh, information there. That's what uh, the picture of a uh, small little tour going on. You can sign up for tours that go on there. You can contact us about purchasing the various different crops that we grow. And for 24 years, we've, um, we've uh, raised um, everything from corn and beans, small grains, to uh, certified organic produce. Chestnuts, hazelnuts, pine nuts, and apples are our uh, primary uh, woody crops. Um, part of what we also do is the plant breeding, selecting for early to reproduce, um, heavy yielding, pest and disease resistant, and, and especially, it doesn't seem to be as important these days, but uh, especially cold hardy uh, genetics. Um, and we intentionally uh, mistreat, we don't intentionally mistreat the plants, but we intentionally give them less than optimal care because we're looking for the plants that have the, uh, the most uh, rugged survival um, characteristics, whatever those might be. So uh, all of our plants have, uh, you know, been raised in an environment with no um, uh, chemical fertilizers, no pest or disease sprays, and very minimal weed control. Weed control sometimes only is mowing once or twice a year and grazing by animals. Uh, um, <laughs> most of the plants also get heavily browsed by animals, uh, not just cattle, but uh, deer, of course, a lot of deer. And then restoration agriculture development is the other uh, branch of, of what I do. And so what we've done on that one, one farm in southwest Wisconsin, we help others. We do everything from initial site consultation just to help you out along your way, do an agroforestry conversion from whatever you're doing now to a more integrated system. Um, we'll do installation of earthworks, ponds and terraces and swales and uh, tree planting, that sort of thing. Teach a lot of workshops. And if you just want some sort of design done, um, that's okay. I think it's kind of silly to spend money on a, on a drawing when you can go ahead and put something in the ground that actually works. And um, do a lot of ongoing phone consultations for, for folks um, who want to keep connected with us. We have quite a few, uh, quite a few of us uh, on both teams, um, probably all together. There's a dozen or so of us that um, that do both the nursery and the uh, and the consulting side of things. I first kind of got interested in the whole agroforestry thing and um, you know growing things a different way, raising food a different way when I was a teenager. Uh, read, first read Tree Crops by J. Russell Smith, which was written in the 1920s, 1926, I believe it was. Uh, at, in his day, about 50% of all um, staple food crops, our grains and legumes, were fed to livestock. Um, and there was a lot of erosion going on. It was just as the whole uh, um, Soil Conservation Service was getting started, which eventually became the USDA NRCS, National Resource Conservation Service. He proposed that we grow um, woody crops, tree crops, and have those seeds and fruits, you know, nuts and berries primarily, become feed for our livestock. And then the grass underneath is where you graze them. Uh, we would have a two-dimensional or two-story agriculture, as he said. And uh, that really uh, intrigued me a lot because I spent too much time in a garden as a kid. Uh, being the oldest and most responsible of, of three boys, um, I was supposed to like be the one that did all the weeding and hoeing in the garden. And it was hot and it was sweaty and it sucked and I didn't like boiled carrots anyways. I'd rather go out run in the woods and collect hazelnuts and hickory nuts and see if there were any chestnuts on the, some of the last remaining American chestnuts around and grapes and berries and on and on and on. 
was probably later on in my 20s when I ran into the work of Bill Mollison, Permaculture. That's uh, the original hardcover edition of the Permaculture Designer's Manual. Uh, I, I got plugged into permaculture so long ago that in the back of this permaculture designer's manual was the names, addresses, and phone numbers of everybody who'd ever taken a, a permaculture design course training. And so uh, nowadays is you know, hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of people around the world have taken permaculture training. Permaculture originally was meant the, it was a contraction of two words, permanent and agriculture. And if you look back here in 1926, J. Russell Smith was talking about a permanent agriculture because the, you know, the agriculture of annual grains means you have to um, destroy an existing ecosystem, establish your your annual crops. They grow for one season, then they die. Then you got to go do it again and again and again and again. Not very permanent. Once you wear the soil out, which was the most common way of uh, farming um, uh, annual crops, you had to move somewhere else. And so many of the problems uh, with today's economy, with our culture, our uh, um, social uh, interactions, uh, class, all relate to annual crops and annual cropping. So it was in here that I, I started to put together from permaculture uh, the design portion of things. Well, we can design human habitats, um, and a lot of the design uh, comes from nature. We want to copy, imitate nature, and interact with it. So that really uh, stuck with me and was instrumental in my, uh, my decisions with what I've done on the farm and, and elsewhere. I uh, was in my uh, early 20s, homesteaded in Alaska for 10 years, 300 miles northeast of Anchorage. And uh, ouch, that hurts, whatever that noise is. And um, while I was out there, I realized that I was basically living in an outpost. It was almost like an island colony. You'd go to town every you know six weeks or so and load up on food and bring it out, uh, out to the uh, wilderness. Well, what was the food? It was all basically annual crops based, whether it was whether it was noodles or bread uh, or even eggs that were fed grains um, or meat that was fed grains. It was all coming from this kind of stuff. This this is actually a photograph I took in uh, Uganda a number of years ago. Notice the hazy sky and then wheat as far as the eye can see um, this exact site was a high tropical forest with chimpanzees in it four years prior to this picture being taken that's what our annual uh annual agriculture does in order to get this uniformity of crop and this massive amount of of bulk carbohydrate um annual crops agriculture has to eradicate a three-dimensional system so how can i feed myself and how can the world feed itself without destroying the you know the planet and how can we eat meat because um, I tried my hand at being a vegetarian for a few years. Um, I was a, a Francis Moore Lappe adherent. I was really good at what I did and just didn't do well my digestive system. I don't think I've ever had worse gas in my life than when I was a vegetarian. Um, and one of the things about cattle eating grains uh, that really kind of drove me crazy, still does today, is is cattle are not adapted uh, created, evolved, whatever to eat grains. They are they're grazers and browsers. There's this big, huge processing unit that that takes rough cellulose and turns it into meat and milk and leather. And um, I really like butter and I really like a good marbled steak. So I was wasn't about to give up eating eating animal products. But we've got to do things a different way because you know, in my opinion, cutting down a, a tropical rainforest to plant grains to feed cows is really, 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 really stupid when we could um, design a system that incorporates all of the wildlife, uh, all of the humans, and still has animals in it because they're animals, mammals are all over this world. Um, so I decided to get involved in a kind of a little bit of a crazy, shaky real estate deal, 100% debt financed under the, you know, the question that I was asking most myself is, can I go to the Corn Belt USA Purchased an old rundown piece of corn, a corn farm that had been abandoned because it was marginal for whatever reason. And so it looked like the uh, upper half of this picture here when first purchased. And then the lower half of this picture was uh, four years ago now, an aerial photograph of New Forest Farm. Can we restore um, chemical uh, annual crop agricultural um, farms by farming it? 
answer is yes. I learned quite a bit in the past 24 years. Uh, yes, we can do it, and the farm itself can pay its own way. It can pay for its own restoration, and it can still provide food for for humans. And uh, what I was especially interested in, still am, is how can human beings raise their staple food crops, their carbohydrates, proteins, and oil, like the wheat, the rice, the beans, the uh, lentils, chickpeas, legumes, etc., the things that makes our bread and our pasta. How can we raise the staple food crops um, in perennial systems? And we don't have to wait until uh, perennial wheat is, is perfected in bread, even though we now have Kernza and some other varieties of perennial grains that are out there. We've got trees to do that for us. I wrote about my experiences in this book, Restoration Agriculture. If you haven't checked it out, I think you should check it out. It's pretty cool. Um, my publisher, and Fred was, was the guy's name. He said, yeah, write a book. And then, you know, for six months or so, the sales will be pretty good. Well, then when the sales drop off, you write another one. Um, and you can do that for years and years and years. Well, sales on restoration agriculture have either gone up or held steady for the past um, six years now. And it's a, a multiple award-winning book. Uh, it's written in a sixth grade reading level because that's basically all I can write. And what it's not is it's not a Ph.D. thesis. It's, it's uh, not a, a scientific treatise on anything. And there's a lot of things in there that, that a lot of people, especially the people who take most offense at what's written in there, are people who are, quote, unquote, orchardists, because I didn't follow any of the rules in their rule book. I followed the rules that, that nature was setting up all around me and teaching me. So step number one that I learned is, in, and it's probably the most simple, no matter where you are, there are plant community types that thrive in your location. And if you want to create a perennial agriculture based on your region, uh, it's in your best interest to identify your biome and the dominant plant community types. Then within those plant community types, you pick the ones that are going to produce food, fuels, medicines, fiber, feed for animals, etc. Step two is to construct some sort of earthworks, large or small, depending on the scale, the site, the soil types, uh, etc., to manage the water resource. Every place on this planet that actually has plants living there has actually uh, some sort of precipitation, either rainfall or fogs and mists. And it's in our best interest to design our agricultural systems to capture, store, um, and if necessary, concentrate it. If necessary, distribute it, spread it out. Uh, so the patterns that you see on the lower picture of New Forest Farm there, those are all um, because of the uh, water uh, management channels. I like to call them swales. USDA calls them terraces. I don't care what you call them. It moves the water around and helps to soak it in. Number three, you establish your perennial polycultures that are identified in step one, and then you use your agroforestry techniques. That was really key to be able to cash flow short term while setting up uh, longer term systems with the agroforestry techniques. Number four was now instead of thinking in a grid, north, south, east, west, or whatever, based on your property lines, all fences, roads, utilities, pipelines, buildings, et cetera, now fit into the water management pattern that we put onto the landscape in, uh, in uh, example number two. Then number five, we just basically manage for eternity by closely mimicking the historic disturbance regime. And um, we'll get to it later, but the primary plant community type that I mimicked on New Forest Farm was the oak savanna. And uh, oak savanna, uh, savanna is a, it's a very... Um, a changeable phase in ecosystem development <clears throat> post grassland and its pre closed canopy forest. And it actually requires disturbance in order to stay in that form in the Midwest, the humid Midwest where, where new forest farm is located. If you left all these species alone, they would eventually close the canopy. The grass would stop growing underneath and you, you begin to develop a shade you know, a shade uh, loving and only shade tolerant forest plants can grow there. Um, if you're in a in a more arid environment, once the canopy closes, there can be a collapse of all of most of the vegetation, and it can uh, degenerate into a um, uh, into a, a scrub chaparral type situation. So a savanna, uh, loose definition is between 30 and 60 percent canopy closure. And there's always grass growing or, you know, grass and ground forages, um, prairie plants, broadleaves, etc. Once you close the canopy and the, uh, you start to see bare soil again, you're entering into a forest phase. So a lot of people have called this, you know, a, a, a 
a large scale forest farm. It's not a forest. Uh, it's not intended to be a forest at all. It's a savanna. I want 110 acres of grass on that 110 acres, and I want 110 acres of trees on that 110 acres, and they'll both fit, and that's where the management comes in. We, do, we manage it um, similar to how animals would and similar to how windfall and how fire would. And then this is what you can get. This picture was taken 15 years in, and this picture actually it very well may be one of the starting points of the Savannah Institute. This uh, college student, Kevin Wolves was out at the farm. I think he spent two seasons on the farm, and he was doing these random plot samples to see where on the farm what kind of yields we were getting. And on this 10 meter by 10 meter square right here, he crunched all the numbers and all the plants. He identified all the plants that were there, cut, weighed, and measured all the you know anally ridiculous measurements that you know PhD students or candidates have to do, and said, "Hey, Mark, guess what? On this particular spot right here, this particular plot out yields." corn on human calories per acre. A lot of people have said that I claim that this spot out yields corn on calories per acre, and that's not true. Um, it out yields corn on human calories per acre, mostly because uh, corn calories for all the corn that's being grown in the, in the uh, eastern part of the USA has to be discounted because of tro the trophic uh, levels, and that if you're going to take uh, corn and feed it to a cow, for example, in order to get one pound of food out of a cow, one pound of meat out of a cow, it takes 10 pounds of corn. So there's a discount factor on the corn. Well, we can insert cattle into this particular photograph right here and have no loss to the productivity of the system. It's only gain. Um, and so the total human calories that are coming out of that are greater, and it's a perennial system. So step one, we want to identify the adapted natural plant community types. Now, a lot of people immediately say, oh, but how do we know with global warming and this and that and the other things? Well, time out. The plant community types in North America that I'm about to mention um, have a 900 million year track record of living on this continent or a 6,000 year track record of living on this continent, depending on what reference material you use. These plant community types have lived in North America the plant community types in Europe and Asia, Africa, et cetera, have been here almost forever. They have seen high temperatures. They have seen low temperatures. They've seen ice ages. They've seen, um, you know, carbon sometimes in excess of 600 parts per million, et cetera. These plants have the genetic resources in them and have the reproductive capacities to uh, to change and adapt and evolve through those changes. So you'll have the best success on your site by identifying the adapted natural plant community types of your area. I started a long time ago, back before they had invented that thing called the interweb, and we actually had to go to libraries and grab books. And I found this particular um, uh, image right here, and where New Forest Farm is located is right here at the uh, intersection between Southern Mesic Forest, which is sugar maple basswood, is the shade, uh, the closed canopy shady uh, portion of it, and all surrounded by oak savanna. So what would happen is fires would continue to burn through here and open up the canopy, and there would be oak savanna. And all the southern ridges, south-facing ridges in this region here have the, the oak savanna plant community type on it uh, because it would have been getting baked in the sun. It's rockier uh, bluffs that, uh, that don't hold the water as well. What is that, that oak savanna plant community type? If you look at these black dots in here uh, on the high plains and the gray and the black here and the black on the, on the east coast here, these are all the same plant community type, the oak, oak uh, plant community type. On the east, they would have occurred as openings in the forest canopy. Uh, these would have been from big storms coming in, windy stuff coming in, thunderstorms, tornadoes from the Midwest. These would have been from hurricanes down in the southeast there, smashing against the shore. Uh, in the high plains, these black dots would not show up as holes like in the east, but they would show up as islands where there was water, protection from fire, and so on. Whereas all through the Midwest, it was a mixing back and forth of the forms. Now, anywhere on this map and anywhere in California, actually most of the places in the temperate zones around the world, this plant community type exists and uh, has been... Uh, living with themselves uh, for eons. The Fagaceae family is the tallest 
um, species in this. Trees, oak, chestnut, and beech all have large nuts, which are perfect for food, either for humans or for animals. Oak and beech have a habit of bearing irregularly, and uh, chestnut has been under human cultivation for a lot longer, and it bears every single uh, season. Uh, chestnut is different in that it doesn't have the oils of the true nuts. It's uh, mostly carbohydrate, 4% protein. The protein is a complete protein, more like egg white. Uh, so there's, uh, I chose chestnut because I want to have crops every single year and regular feed for my animals. So that's what I picked for the overstory. Understory of apples. In North America, there were crab apples. Um, that were native, and some hawthorns that are all in the same family. Uh, I decided to go with a wide genetic selection of seedling uh, apples uh, to see which ones would grow with strategic total utter neglect. Stun. I wanted to have stuff that was highly productive, especially when young, pest and disease resistant, and would grow with heavy competition and withstand browsing because I knew that even if I... Uh, uh, didn't graze cattle and hogs in the system, there would be deer browsing on it. Hazelnut was a dominant shrub, so doggone it, I'm going to substitute hazelnuts for high hazelnuts. They're really delicious, and if you guys don't like Nutella, I think you should try a new addiction. The prunuses, <laughs> cherries, plums, uh, peaches, if you're in a warm enough climate. Um, I've got apricots going on the, on the farm way out of their zone. They shouldn't be um, hanging out at where we are in Wisconsin. <laughs> Uh, raspberries, grapes, and currants, also blackberries were thrown in that mix, and gooseberries, uh, currants and gooseberries in the shade, raspberries grown on the outside of these tree tufts. Uh, of course, all the biomass is being decomposed by fungi, whether it's leaves, branches, bark, uh, you know, up in the trees, down on the ground, surface, uh, surface fungi, subsurface fungi, mycorrhizal fungi, all kinds of fungi going on, the plants that grow there, and animals. In this system, there is a full, complete human diet, except for slight deficiencies in salt and then any other major uh, uh, mineral deficiency you might have in your region, which in our region it happens to be selenium. Uh, this, is a, this is a full, complete diet. We don't need to have uh, any, other, uh, any other foods in our system. It's a perennial system, and we can manage it with fire and grazing or other simple tools forever and ever and ever and ever. It's an ecological model. This is what it might look like. Let's imagine now that I planted these trees. That's the plant community type right there. I'm keeping it semi-open by whatever means possible. What's interesting about the savannas of the world, the savannas of the world are the homes to mammals. And that this, is, this is the V prime ultimate human habitat. It actually, you know, mammal habitat, it happens to be the ultimate human habitat. Uh, humans have been living in the savannas uh, and playing golf on Saturdays in systems that look like this ever since the first human being walked up out of the uh, Old Divide Gorge in uh, Tanzania, however many years ago that was. So if I imitate the plant communities on the upper part, I, of course, I'm going to design it a little bit more for efficiency and water management. Um, these were the types of animals that used to graze here. It's a who's who of North American uh, megafauna and um, most commonly in the um, eastern latitudes in the human, humid uh, North America were mastodons, which are the ones on the lower left. Well, we may not have mastodons and woolly mammoths on our site, but we can imitate large animal impact by having animals. Look at that. We can have cows and pigs and turkeys and sheep and chickens. Now, if I have a perennial system growing above ground, and then I have these animals that are that are grazing through the system, uh, there's there's really no need for plowing, um, planting, harvesting, all that all that kind of stuff. We can just uh, we can eat off of the the woody crops. We could also eat some of the animals and be selling the animals as part of our uh, our uh, income stream or selling young stock. I know some folks who are doing agroforestry, and all they're doing is they're raising animals to sell to other people. They don't actually um, send them off to the slaughterhouse. So in theory, once you get the system set up, it's it's it doesn't require any more cash inputs, and so you should have another bag of money just like this little farmer guy down the end of the road. I designed New Forest Farm to be mechanized, mechanically, mechanically planted, mechanically harvested, maintained and harvested, obviously processed afterwards. We're, if we're going to have 10 billion people on this planet and we're going to design ecological systems, we've got to be able to uh, get that product to the market at scale. And actually one of the biggest problems right now 
in the sustainable slash regenerative, whatever you want to call it, restoration agriculture realm, is that we don't have enough producers producing these crops in order to justify all of the mechanization all the way up the value chain, including distribution. We just need more, hundreds of thousands of acres of this. Uh, till we get to, to this sort of scale, this is actually black walnuts in Stockton, Missouri. This is the kind of scale we need to be thinking. We don't have to do this on each individual farm. We can have aggregated uh, collaborative business entities. Um, that's, that's how I've sold most of my produce uh, through the years. I'm a, a member of the Organic Valley Co-op, and it's a really great idea to have a whole bunch of small farmers gather together, and our economy scale comes at the aggregation level, the value-added processing level, and the transportation to the market level. <clears throat> Step two, we're going to optimize the rainfall and runoff resource to uh, meet our goals. So this is where the patterning comes from. The water used to go down this main valley, forward 600 feet, drop 100 feet, all kinds of erosion. And this is what it causes. This is Viola, Wisconsin, yet again. If you look at this chart right here, this chart shows that 16 out of the 17 highest rainfall events um, have occurred in the last 20 years. Well, guess what? You know, it's like 19 out of the 20 highest rainfall events in the past 20 years uh, have happened in the last 20 years in, in Wisconsin, southwest Wisconsin. It doesn't matter on the ground as a farmer if it's climate change or if it's cultivation patterns that have changed, a shift to no-till or a stopping of doing USDA terraces and contour farming, there is a reality going on in that we have all of these major rain events and flood events right now. We have to design systems that are resilient to that and can still produce crops instead of getting drowned out like this cornfield and requiring government bailouts because you can't feed people on a government bailout forever. <clears throat> and that was my dad's town of Viola, Wisconsin. Ah, geez, three times this year that place went underwater. So we're going to do the patterning, uh, move the water all around this way. Uh, your farm might look different than mine because you might have different goals of where you want to have the water. One of the reasons why I wanted to have more smaller water features is I wanted to have ephemeral ponds for amphibians for pest control, and I also wanted to have water points for livestock. Um, you can see some of the water points here in the center and to the right of the center. That's where... Um, you can water cattle, or my favorites, piggies. And these are the piggies after a big rainfall event. Um, they only seem to pick a few of these as their wallow spots, and uh, it's really fun to watch them. When After a really big rain once, I remember watching these guys go out there, and they kind of go into their wallow expecting it to be mud like yesterday and just fall off the edge, and they're in over their heads. Pigs actually can swim. Step number three is to establish our perennial polycultures using agroforestry techniques. And we're going to go farm in the same time direction as succession. If you've ever planted a garden and get weeds in your garden, you pull the weeds. What you're doing is you're fighting against succession because nature wants to go in a, in a, in a forward time-wise through a series of plants to get to a particular mature um, uh, phase. And disturbance is what keeps it in the phase that you want. So by weeding your carrot patch, you are ecologically disturbing that site to arrest its succession at the carrot stage. Well, I want to get this to the savanna, the yolk savanna stage, and maintain it there, and it's been there for years now, for quite some time. This is early stage um, uh, agroforestry, successional agroforestry. In uh, between these two dark lines are planted the rose, polyculture rose with chestnut as the overstory. Uh, these are the alleys. Uh, some are annual crops and some are perennial crops, such as asparagus. And in these rows right here where the cursor is going, if you can see the cursor, are the chestnut, apple, cherry, hazelnut, raspberry, grape, currants, gooseberry. In different spatial arrangements, wider alleys, narrower alleys, sometimes there's multiple woody species in a row, sometimes there's single woody species in a row. No one was doing this, you know, 25 years ago, and I just had to figure out what would work um, in every situation. Same site. Just a few years later, you can see the trees starting to show up. And this is all zucchini in these rows going left to right, asparagus going forward uh, into the screen. A few years after that still, you can see some squash on the far right over where um, it just drops off the screen. Looking down one of the squash rows, this is a simple agroforestry row of trees on either side. Look on the right-hand side of this field, you see an overstory of um, – a hybrid poplar. What you can't see in this picture very well because it's fuzzy is there's a mid-story of apples, standard apples, and then a low shrubby layer 
is, uh, is hazelnut. It's done a lot of experimenting with different, um, you know, overstory, midstory, unstory, understory, all in the same row. As time goes on, your, your alleys, the branches of your trees start to close in. You can choose to either trim your trees so you can continue to use the alleys, and then the trimmings then become substrate for mushrooms or they become bedding for animals or just uh, mulch on the ground that then decays. It's part of your fertility uh, cycle. Or in my case, what I did is I started to bail out of some uh, alleys and no longer grow crops there, but I would um, replace formerly uh, grown crops there with the weeds. If you've got weeds showing up in your system that are at all useful, say, okay, this site wants to grow elderberries and it wants to grow mulberries. What you see here is a row of uh, elderberries that have been planted right down the middle between these two um, rows of chestnut. This is the same site as the previous slide. Um, this, is, this is a primary pig hangout uh, portion of the system. It's the oldest um, chestnut and hazelnut uh, planting on the farm. Um, it's, it's been all the way back since 1995 when we first put that in the ground. You can see the elderberries blooming and the chestnuts blooming. It's been mowed once, but this is also uh, grazed by both cattle and hogs and chickens. Uh, some years we've had sheep, but then, of course, my favorites are the piggies. Uh, a couple of things I want to point out here is we actually put rings in the noses of our piggies so they don't really root up the ground a lot. They still do when it rains a lot. Uh, sometimes the rings come out, and sometimes we replace them. Um, a lot of people say that it's cruelty to the animals and all that kind of stuff, but I bet you half the people on this uh, webinar right now have some kind of body piercing that doesn't hurt once you put it in. Um, unless somebody really pulls on it. So if you're going to plow the ground with your nose, it hurts. So they stop plowing the ground, and it, and it encourages them early on to uh, eat, eat grass a lot. Um, early on, they don't have a lot of the woody forage, of that plant community type with the, with the chestnuts, hazelnuts, apples, uh, mulberries, elderberries, that sort of thing, currants, raspberries, grapes, gooseberries. So they get a lot of produce, um, rejected produce that, you know, they have caterpillar bites in it or sun scald, some sort of things. Uh, a lot of uh, squashes and pumpkins through the years and green peppers are almost all the time. And this is, was one of my favorite sows. This was Tammy. What a sweetheart she was. As you can see here, they kind of go on patrol and they, there's a certain height of grass. Once it gets up above their eyes or so, they really don't graze it anymore. And I don't exactly know why. I don't care why. So uh, I try to get the cattle to graze through first. You know, timing on a farm is crazy. and You never know when the cattle are going where or how many cattle you're going to have some summers and some summers with no cattle at all. Uh, so sometimes I'll, I'll go through and um, mow to maintain uh, the proper height for the pigs uh, so that they'll graze better. Um, I mowed in the pigs this year because they didn't have any cattle this year. I mowed in the pigs maybe twice, I think, um, to keep the grass in the optimum height. The stuff on the upper right is too tall. They don't really like it. The stuff in the middle is too low because it's just recovering from mowing, but it'll come back. It bounces back. You'll notice also that the pigs are lean and they're muscular looking. They don't really get fat, fat like a corn-fed pig would um, until uh, they start fattening on the uh, chestnuts in the fall. And, this, and you can see also the fencing in here. It's minimal fencing, two strand of electric. Um, used to have the solar, portable solar stuff. Now I use like the, um, it's a 24 joule uh, system and it really gives them a zap. Also gives me a zap. I touched what the fence once while trying to fix it down low and I was told that I did a backflip from a squat. So that was pretty cool. You see the grain, the uh, gravity box on the left. We do feed them some grain. Uh, we, uh, I'll get a grain bin full of, you know, the um, gravity box full. It's about three tons. And uh, when we get the pigs, I only do seasonal. Um, I buy feeders, feeder to finish. It takes six months instead of five because they're not getting the concentrated energy that you would out of solid grain diet. And on average, you're getting about two-thirds of a pound um, per day. I feed them enough when they're little to keep a 30-pound pig alive. And then throughout the season, they got to go out and find out, find the rest of their food. Notice how they don't have the pasture all ripped up. Now that they're big, they're eating, you know, probably 8 to 10, 12 pounds of food a day, but they're still only getting, you know, two-thirds of a pound of a, of a grain mix. So one of those uh, gravity boxes will last me a year or two, depending on how many animals I have. When I've had pigs in with the cattle, 
don't put big pigs in with little cows because the big pigs know what cow manure is and they'll go up to the calves and try to like get the manure right out of the back side of the calf as soon as the calf lifts, lifts its tail. But whenever the, the pigs are in with the, uh, with the cattle, uh, they seem to have gained faster. Um, and part of what I've been told is there's a lot of digestive enzymes and, and critters and all that kind of stuff in the uh, cattle manure that now inoculates the pig's gut with the proper bacteria to, to better utilize the grass. They'll graze and they'll gain just fine without the cattle, but I've, I've noticed that they, uh, they, they gain a little bit better with the cattle in there. This picture shows, uh, I didn't have a full picture of it, I tried looking for it. When I first get the pigs, I put them in a, a fence of these T-posts, and you see these two by four space um, chicken wires, the heavy duty chicken wire, not hog panel. And then on the inside of the whole fence, I put the electric fence. So you put, first put the pigs in, they're not used to the electric. So I got a really tight, tight, tight electric fence with the hard fence on the back of it um, in case they happen to go through the electric. Well, it takes about, you know, I don't know, eight to 10 days before they figure out the electric. Then once they figure out the electric, you drop, I, I pull away the, the wire screen on this side. And so all they have is the electric fence holding them back. And then once they're totally trained to just the electric wire, I'll go ahead and move the electric wire. And sometimes it takes them two days before they'll actually leave this space because they knew there was an electric fence there yesterday, but it's not today. So then we'll kind of bait them out. These guys right here were a little bit chicken. And then I had to bait them out by starting. These guys are at their feed trough. And you'd start with the feed trough in here, even though there's no fence in the way. And then you keep move it out, move it out, move it out till they got accustomed to moving back and forth where the fence used to be. They're really, really civil and respect electric fence. Imagine you've got a wet nose, you're only eight inches off the ground, very well grounded, and you hear them squeal, and you know your pig got shot, zapped. <clears throat> um, they have escaped on occasions, but they don't go anywhere because we've created such an incredibly rich um, pig habitat that there's no food for them in anywhere else. And here we see there's a mulberry tree here. These are hickories. Uh, there, there's oak trees in this system, cherries. Uh, you can see, once again, the fence here. And this is the uh, chestnuts. You've got mulberries. They'll eat the berries right off the, right off the trees and bushes. They start with their, their, their feed. Their uh, woody crops start in the spring with currants. And then they go to raspberries. And then mulberries kind of like mid-June all the way through to mid-August. They have a long period of dropping. And when the mulberries are on the trees, the pig's noses are purple and their poops are purple. They just love mulberries. Can't get enough mulberries for pigs. It's really great. Then, of course, they go into apples and um, hazelnuts, hazelnut cleanings from processing, uh, hickories, oaks, and then they finish on the uh, chestnut. It's just a – I did an interesting experiment. I went online and, and kind of searched for images of, you know, myself or New Forest Farm – about 50% of these pictures I found online. It's pretty wild. This is not one that I took. It just shows the chestnuts in bloom and the pigs hanging out in the shade in this spot. This is where their trough was at the time. They're all lined up at that trough. And then we'll move that through the, uh, through the area. And uh, one of the things that we really take really great care of is pigs are really civil animals. Uh, we've taken these away from an interesting environment. They would have been raised in confinement fed a pure grain diet and then sent to slaughter and, you know, been eaten by humans. Their fate was going to be that they, they were raised to be eaten by humans and they're going to be eaten by humans. So we just take them out for six months and we give them a good life. We insist that all of our animals have names. You'd kind of name them on personalities and personality types and we treat them with care and love and respect. And they're our friends. They are absolutely, totally our friends. They'll, you call them by name and stuff like that. And one of the reasons why I do that is I kind of I kind of feel personally that if we if we don't care for these beings as as the precious beautiful creatures that they are we lose our humanity. I want to make sure that when when I eat this animal it hurts. Excuse me, I didn't mean to do that. It hurts because I love these guys. We have a precious relationship with one another. They depend on me and I depend on them. And, and I always want it to hurt a little bit because I want that love to be acknowledged that these are just incredible, incredible animals. And, and little girls can come in and play with these pigs because the pigs are like kitty cats and puppy dogs. Sometimes it can, <laughs> it can hurt a little bit because they'll come up and lean on you and then like lay down, try to lay down on your lap like a dog. And when they get bigger, it gets funny sometimes. Um, 
Here's just another picture showing you they're walking up towards the chestnuts. The chestnuts aren't quite ripe. This was in a drier year, evidently here. You can see how brown it is. Uh, here's the hazelnut cleanings that these guys are crunching on. Um, they'll e eat hazelnuts, um, shell and all, just gobble them right up and hear them crunching away. Uh, they'll eat hickory nuts, uh, shell and all. Black walnuts, only the, the bigger pigs can get them, and, and they'll, typically they'll eat more of the black walnut uh, the, the initial drops, the ones that have some sort of pest in it, weevils that fall to the ground, they'll eat those. And that's actually good because it's a, um, it's a, somewhat of a parasiticide, the black walnuts are, so aren't the hickories. And then, of course, here comes the glory days in the fall out at New Forest Farm. It's about mid-September to mid-October. Uh, the big trick with, with this system here is slaughter date and drought is I try to plan the slaughter date to be somewhere between like the 16th and the 30th of October. And if I can't get it, and you got to sign up for a slaughter date, like uh, at least six months in advance. And if you can't get a, a date for the early part of the season, if it's like Halloween and you couple that with a drought season, the uh, chestnuts really don't get as many chestnuts and they fall off the tree faster, sooner and the pigs eat up all of the chestnuts, and then there's no grass growing because it's so dry. Those are the only times that I've had to go ahead and up their feed. And it's been three different years that I've had to up their feed in the fall because we just ran out of feed because their slaughter date was too late. I don't want to put the slaughter date too early because then they don't eat all the chestnuts, and I want to utilize as many of those chestnuts as possible. By the way, I don't eat bread. I don't eat noodles. Chestnuts are my bread and my noodles. You can use them any, anywhere. You use potatoes. Uh, and this is, this is what the pigs do in the fall. Once, once the um, uh, chestnuts are really falling, they're in there, and there is not a chestnut on the ground. Uh, they, they tend to pug it up with their hoofs. Uh, what they'll even do sometimes to get chestnuts out of depressions in the ground, they'll use their lower jaw and start. It looks like they're rooting up the ground, but it's not. It's just like a shallow scratching on the surface. One of the things I think is really cool about precision fertilizer so if you've got a tree that really, really, really bears a lot of nuts, it's obviously putting a lot of its resources into producing nuts. It probably needs extra fertilizer. How convenient that if it produces more nuts, the pigs spend more time under there and they fertilize it more. So your, so your heavier producing trees get a heavier dose of fertilizer. The lighter producing trees get a lighter dose of fertilizer. And most of the bearing characteristics of chestnuts are is uh, genetic. It's not, not um, necessarily fertility related. Now, this picture isn't necessarily a beautiful picture, but I threw it in there because it shows a lot of the other things that are going on. And if you don't know how to identify plants in the past, you know, on teen slides, I'll point out a couple here. Um, this is a young cherry tree that's seeded on its own. Evidently, a bird dropped the seed. Uh, in here, these, these stems now, this is in the fall because you can see the pigs are eating up all the chestnuts. These uh, empty stems are currants. You see these currants still have some leaves. You can see the grapes from the grapevines. It looks like a, a jungle mess, but it's not. Everything is in discrete rows, and I can actually drive up and down between, between the row of chestnuts here. I can make four passes with a mower, and I clean that out. And, and actually, after the pigs have gone to market and the ground firms up a little bit and sometimes frozen, I'll go in and I just clean everything up, and it, it neatens it right up. It chops up uh, all the leaves and the sticks spreads out the manure a little bit so it decomposes and will be ready to go and be nice green grass in the springtime. And um, some of the yields in here, I go through and I can hand harvest grapes and apples uh, from high and let the other stuff fall down to the pigs. This is the first year that I actually observed pigs. I knew they did it because I could observe it. Uh, I could see that the vines were pulled to the ground. So the pigs were pulling grapevines down to the ground. But I saw the pigs standing on their hind feet eating bunches of grapes out of the grapevines, and it was such a cool sight. The grapes that they were eating were a little bit underripe, and they didn't seem to care. It was just crunch, 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 crunch. And, of course, they love apples, um, and so they get plenty of apples and the hazelnuts and the chestnuts uh, all in discrete rows. One of the things I really like about uh, designing this, this perennial system is it's – it's a natural plant community type that belongs there. And these somewhat rare animals that live in our area now have their home back. A wood turtle on the left, 
a loggerhead shrike on the right and a northern cricket frog down at the bottom with 40 different little tiny ephemeral pools all over our uh, all over the farm. Ephemeral pools are ones that, vernal pools is another name for it, they fill up with water in the springtime and then they either soak in or evaporate over time and all of the uh, um, amphibian species of the Midwest except for green frogs and bullfrogs are adapted to vernal pools. There's, you know, spring peepers and chorus frogs, the, the cricket frogs, um, I can't remember all their names, leopard frogs, uh, toads, um, the, the songs from the, the coming out of the, pound, the ponds are, are absolutely beautiful, and uh, bird song in the spring. There was an ornithologist from Madison that came out once during the uh, migration in the fall, Walking in from the road to a wind turbine, which was about a quarter of a mile, and then back, he counted 125 different species of bird. Now, that's not land that we set aside as a preserve, as conservation, or as a habitat island. This is a working farm. By farming this way, we have created the habitat that to now become home for endangered species, and we've raised a tremendous amount of food, fuels, medicines, fibers, etc., and I didn't spend a lot of time here because we don't have a lot of time talking about the, the decay cycle, uh, grow a tremendous uh, amount of um, uh, edible mushrooms. And this summer, because it was so wet and rainy in Wisconsin, was really, a really good year for mushrooms. Lots of shiitakes, uh, enokis, oyster mushrooms, lion's mane. And uh, this one right here, I forgot the uh, common name for it. This is one of the more uncommon fungi in North America. And it's like virtually extinct. Nobody seems to care about it because it's just a fungus. Who cares, right? It doesn't really do anything. I don't know if it does anything that you know is essential for life, the universe, and everything, but there it is. I got this rare and endangered mushroom growing on my farm, and we're farming it. We're paying the bills with, uh, with the agricultural crops and eating really, really, really well. And if you were to look at this and take a, a savanna ecologist out to this and say, oh, yeah, this is a degraded oak savanna. Yep, that's exactly what it is. So this actually is ecological restoration simultaneous with producing an agricultural, agricultural crops, hazelnuts. We're doing breeding work on the hazelnuts. So I just love this one right here. We've got a, a tree frog that evidently it's really, really hungry because its eyes are bigger than its stomach because it's sitting right next to a polyphemus moth caterpillar. Polyphemus, well, you have lots of polyphemus moths and luna moths. Polyphemus moth is also another uh, very rare moth in North America. It's the largest moth in North America. It looks like this, and it's the size of a dinner plate. Almost some, some of them can be 10 inches across. You Sometimes you think you see a, a slow-moving bat going through an air, but it's a polyphemus moth. Here we go, the mushrooms. We can farm the decay cycle as well. I mean, we're farming the growth cycle, we're farming the decay cycle. And uh, the work that we're doing as agroforesters, if you look on any, any of the um, studies that are, that are coming out across the world uh, by the scientific community, uh, I just read another report that came out of, um, uh, it was a result of the research that was done for the COP21 um, climate meetings in Paris a couple of years back. Agroforestry is on the top six um, practices to get carbon out of the atmosphere and keep it within the terrestrial uh, zone. We can produce our food, fuels, medicines, and fiber, and correct any kind of climate imbalances with the agroforestry practices. And for goodness sake, the eyes of the future are looking back at us, and they are praying for us to see beyond our own time and to do these things to make this world a better place. And so with that, I'll take it to here and say that those of us who are crazy to think uh, those who think they're who they're crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who actually do it so let's go be a little crazy and put roots in the ground thank you for your uh, patience and being here and uh, I guess we could open it up to questions now wonderful thank you so much Mark what a You're welcome information. Um, I know there are questions from our audience so for those of you listening uh, now I'm going to activate the Q&A session you, if you're joining us from your computer, you should see a pop-up now that you can click and get in the queue um, to ask a question. If you're on your phone, you can dial star six, and um, that will also put you in the queue to activate that mic. And let me make sure Mark is 
Yeah, you're muted. Unmuted. Still on? Okay, great. Yep. Uh, so, anyone with a question there? All right, we've got some popped up here. So, another Mark is first. Mark, Hi, Mark. Monte. Yeah, you're good. Uh, hello. Uh, yeah, I was just curious. Um, well, I, two questions. One is what breeds of pig do you use? And two is when you say six months to slaughter, is that from purchase or six months of age? No, the uh, the six months is six months from purchase to slaughter. Okay. Um, and I'll get them, you know, anywhere between 30 and 60 pounds or so is about how big they are. And uh, what was the first question? I know I grinned and I almost laughed at myself when you asked it. What did you say? Uh, what, what breed? <laughs> oh, what, right. I tell you what breed it is. Uh, my favorite breed of pigs is what they call cheap. Because <laughs> um, when you look at the numbers on pigs, uh, even selling direct to you know consumers who want to have grass fed pigs and all that kind of stuff there's not a, it's not really all that big of a margin. The cattle are much better uh, as far as the dollars and cents are concerned um, and so cheap actually does matter if you look at the pigs on the upper left there uh, for a number of years, I was working with a breeder who was uh, doing Tamworth Berkshire crosses, and those are my fam favorites. Tamworth and Berkshires, I've noticed, seem to gain better on the grass. The uh, Berkshires took a while for them to figure it out, and then they kind of got a lean enough, and their their body, you know, shape anyways is a little bit narrow, and so I'd kind of get concerned, but then they'd, they'd do just fine after a while. The Tamworths, you just put them down, they start eating grass. I bet you that you really wouldn't have to put rings in them, and they wouldn't do much. Uh, I've seen actually growers that have used them without rings; they don't do much damage. And so you see on the on the lower right, the guy that I work with now has has Tamworths in his mix, and so I get quite a bit of the uh, Tamworth uh, genetics in there. And that guy down on the left, that's Henry. What a sweetheart, Henry! I swear, was a kitty cat. He was just one of these really gentle, timid kind of souls, and he would just come up to you and lay down and sigh. So I like to buy cheap pigs, Tamworths and Berkshires, and the Tamworth Berkshire crosses were my favorite favorites. Thank you. You bet. Great. Thanks, Mark. And now Jason is up. How can I plant hazels in a polyculture uh, in preparation for feeding hogs and still have them set up so I could harvest them with machinery someday? Well, if you're gonna if you're gonna harvest by machinery, uh, you'll want to design things a around the machinery. And there, there's a portion of the farm that I call the polyculture. I mean, everything's a polyculture on the farm, but uh, it's it's done polyculture between rows. And so you you just have the hazels all by themselves in in one row, and then your other species in the other row. And what I did for uh, on that on the polyculture section. It was a row of chestnuts, then four rows of hazels, and a row of chestnuts, four rows of hazels, and that repeated. Well, then in the chestnuts, I would put uh, uh, apples and service berry and mulberries and currants. And so the chestnut row was a polyculture itself, but the hazelnut rows were a solid, uh, just hazelnut. And that was intentionally for uh, mechanical harvest of the hazelnuts. Then the widths excuse me, the widths between the rows of hazelnut were based on the machine harvest for the hazelnut. And then the width between the hazelnut row and the chestnut was based on using a sweeper, a uh, savage nut picker rubber for harvesting the um, chestnuts. So you can design it to be a polyculture uh, between the rows. And for, for in this, in, in uh, there's one portion of the farm that I do not uh, harvest any, crops for human sale it's purely the pig paddock that's that's it's i've designed a pig habitat and i'm, and I'm as time goes on with having challenges with labor and the fact that i'm getting more more and more gray hairs in my beard it's like you know what i'm just going to raise more pigs i'm just harvest everything with pigs it's so easy they're so fun they're really really wonderful people great thank you that answers my question you, you betcha so as, what I was getting at, what I was getting at with the uh, with the pigs harvesting everything, because even if even if you're mechanically harvesting, like I was mentioning, the polyculture, a chest, a polyculture row of chestnuts and you know four rows of hazels, you're you're really not able to get in the row with a machine to harvest the chestnuts that fall in the row. 
So that's what the pigs are perfect for. And if you were to do a system where it's, you are harvesting for human sale mechanically, you'd want to time things so that you get in there, you harvest first, uh, then after you've mechanically harvested, you're going to have all these nuts that are down in the row. There's still going to be things that haven't fallen off the plant. Then you turn the pigs loose and you clean up afterwards. Then you'll have enough time uh, with the pigs not being on it uh, so that it will qualify even for certified organic because they, they've had that time uh, the four months plus without animals in the system. Thank you. I used to do that quite a bit with apples. I just have to make sure that – you know, they were in there in the spring and then uh, out for the whole middle of the summer and then back in after we harvested in the fall. Great. Thanks, Jason. Uh, we had a couple of questions typed on the chat box uh, from Patrick. Do you find some trees are better suited for grape trestling than others? Yeah, uh, trees that are alive are much better for putting the, the grapes on um, because they can still grow. And one of the things with the grapes on the trees is what I'm, I'm not doing, a lot of people immediately go there. It's like, oh, they're going to you know, strangle the branches and kill the trees. And how do you pick the grapes that are 60 feet off the ground and all that stuff? It's like, well, I'm managing the system. Why don't I find that picture, see if it will go to it. Um, I'm, I am doing some pruning on the, on the grapes so they don't strangle the trees. And uh, like this one right here. These are all, see how the, you can see these vines on the grapes are kind of going horizontally. I'll pull them down and lay them across the branches this way. Then next year they're going to try to climb up again high, and I just keep pulling them down, pulling them down. And so if, if, you, if you were to look at this from a harvest perspective, I walk along the row, I pick the low-hanging fruit, whether it's apples or grapes, uh, and then anything up high, if it's apples, I'll just let them fall. If it's grapes, I'll pull the vines down and let the pigs take the rest of them. And then the pigs make sure that there's nothing growing down low. And then the cattle will really browse up from the bottom so there's not a lot of uh, branches and not a lot of, not of uh, tangle underneath. So this, because you see how thick and brushy this is, this is mid-height. This is probably thigh, um, I guess, thigh high to, to eight feet high is this view right here. Okay. <clears throat> From Kim, uh, Kim is wondering, how old do trees have to be before you can introduce the pigs without them causing too much damage? Well, at first I was nervous about that, and so I, I would fence them away from the trees. And then over time it's like, well, you know, cattle will browse your trees, but the pigs not really. They could care less. Uh, so I just I just turn them right in. And and I've got, you know, pictures on other slides. I'm trying to remember which – there is one online that has some pictures of, of like the animals right out in there with brand new trees planted. And it all comes down to moving the animals too, as, as if, if you're going to have a bunch of new trees and you put the animals out in there, you want to make sure that you're moving them fast enough so that they'll browse and trample or graze and trample, but not go hungry. Because as soon as they're hungry, they're going to start poking around and eating everything. Um, so as soon as you get a good graze out of them, they, they lay down, they rest, they digest a little. When they start getting back up again, move them or put fence around it. And that portable electric fence, it's incredible stuff. It's so easy to work with. It's, it's light. It's effective. My first roll of, 20, of, of fence is like 20 years old. It's still effective. It still works. The only thing is, is I hate moving fence. It's like, dang, it just takes so much time. But it's incredible stuff. The little uh, the poly wire. Okay, I'll go to Wendy's question and then we'll end on Taylor's. Uh, Wendy's wondering, when it rains a large amount and the pigs either create wallows or root some, what do you plant after they have left that paddock? Well, when it rains, uh, th where they go to wallow is, th is they go right to um, the watering spots that are already there. The, their part, the, most of the little ponds, I call them pocket ponds, in our water management system with swales and berms, um, they're the surge protection in the system. If I get a three inch rain in a, in a day and the water can only infiltrate an inch at a time, the water moves through the channels and fills the ponds. Those are the ephemeral ponds. And then the water starts to soak in and go away. So when it rains, they go right to those, those, um, pocket ponds. And so most of the pocket ponds, I don't plant anything in. The place that does get mucked up a bit, and you've seen it, you saw it under that one uh, photograph I got off the uh, internet of the chestnuts in bloom, where they're, where they're 
their feed trough is, they'll muck that up because when they're in there, they're fighting and wrestling and, you know, they're struggling. They're pigs. They're <laughs> struggling to get the feed and it's not enough feed to, to make them feel full. So they know that whoever gets in there fastest gets the most. Um, and so they muck that up pretty good. But because the um, uh, the sod is, is really well formed, I mean, it's 24 years old now, um, it grows back really, really fast after you move the trough, like a couple weeks. Uh, this this fall, um, this summer was so wet. We had over twice the, the regular average rainfall in southwest Wisconsin that we're supposed to have, and they mucked up a lot of places. And so I've, I've got a, uh, a seed mix that the, uh, the Department of Natural Resources uses for roads, and what I could do is I can get a, a copy of the label of that and send it to um, to Kelly so she can post it along this. And sure. it's a it's a it's got a mix of annual rye, a couple other different perennials in there, uh, and clovers, a couple different types of clovers in there. And it's uh, semi shade tolerant, so you can you know basically plant it on a, a logging road. It's designed for logging roads, reseeding logging roads after you go. Now, of course, it's not the ultimate forage. But my, for me, the ultimate forage in the system is all the woody plants. And with the grasses, I'm just trying to hold it all together. And by now, there's so much seed in the seed bank that the grasses do come in. But when I throw seed on afterwards, I use that DNR trail mix, Wisconsin DNR trail mix. Great. And just to clarify for Alessandra, how many pigs do you have to do you get each year? And then what's your total acreage? Well, the, um, the farm is 110 acres. How many pigs I get in any calendar year depends on how many phone calls I get from people that say, hey, are you doing, you know, your chestnut fed pigs again this year? And I say yes. And if, you know, five people say you're doing pigs this year, I say yes. If 25 people do. So the most I've had at any one time is about 50, somewhere in that ballpark. What I've noticed is once you get up to 25, they start to separate into two herds. And so it's easier to manage them with, with 25 or less. Um so and then now the land that they go on, uh, probably you know the pigs. The pigs don't have to move around. They don't eat as much as cattle do. Uh, so the the pigs probably the most that they do when I had like twenty five or twenty five or so is is uh, that's enough to work with. I had them on maybe ten acres at the most that they impacted. Oh, okay. And so uh, you know an average of one hundred and twenty pounds of purchased feed per pig. And then the rest comes from the system. Okay. So a couple more questions here, if you've got if you've got some time. Sure, I got all night long. <laughs> uh, Taylor is wondering, um, maybe kind of a good a good wrap up question. Um, what sort of resources would you recommend for young farmers or graduates to get started in such agroforestry projects like yours? Boy. <laughs> any, any sort of you know you you mentioned some books at the beginning that are staples yeah um, the, the, are you following the, any any recent up and coming well i do i do but what's interesting see see because what i'm doing you think about this for a second i'm doing ecosystem mimicry first and foremost i'm an ecosystem manager i'm not a pig farmer i'm not a cow farmer I'm not a produce farmer i'm managing this 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 creation and this becoming of a mimicked oak savanna and so i'm using these different enterprises as tools to manage that system and there ain't nobody out there describing these things there is this fellow i think that everybody should pay a lot of attention to he's a, a fairly newly minted phd guy his name is dr kevin wolves <laughs> happens to be the founder of the savannah institute he 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 gets it he, he totally gets it and so uh, restoration agriculture, and like I said, it's, it's a broad brush, simplified version of a big picture of what I'm doing, and it's, and it's what I have been doing. What I like about what Kevin's doing and how it, it perfectly matches with what I'm doing is now he's set up this organization to help study, well, how is it that I've been able to do this? Where can you nudge a system? What if, you, what if you're a farmer that, that uh, really wants to push you know, your chestnut production or your apple production or hazelnut, whatever it is, what, what is an economically worthwhile input to do? My, my problem with, with saying, you know, who would I recommend reading um, is the fact that most agriculture is being done in a reductionist uh, monocrop focus. The hazelnut industry in the upper Midwest right now is a big challenge. I'm, I'm, 
involved up to my neck in the whole hazelnut upper midwest hazelnut development initiative and and everybody who seems to be looking at hazelnuts is looking at hazelnuts as a standalone enterprise well you know it's standalone enterprises monocrop enterprises that are basically part of the problem of agriculture so why would we study somebody's book on apple orcharding when the the reason why apple orcharding isn't really all that successful and reason why it kind of sucks to be in the business is because they're doing a standalone monocrop whether it's organic or chemical that's not how nature works how nature works is with polycultures and if you're imitating your natural plant community types just look at the ditch on the side of the road Look at all those plants growing there. Nobody did anything to prepare the soil, do pest control, fertility management. Nobody did anything, which means it's a very, very low cost system. Well, it won't yield as much as a monocrop of apples or chestnuts or whatever the deal is. That's fine because I'm not interested in total yield. As a person on the ground, I'm not interested in total yield. I'm interested in how little work can I do, how few inputs can I do, and if I have an almost zero input system, my only input costs being, you know, harvest costs of chestnuts or apples, for two examples, um, all of the dollars from those sales go right in my pocket. Instead of spending $999 on inputs and sprays every other week for fungus control, disease control, pest control, blah, 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 uh, and work, all that work and fuel for the tractor and equipment that you need to do it, why not just turn it loose and harvest the picture perfect uh, surplus after it and use the animals to clean up the ones that aren't picture perfect? And that's where the pigs, they, the pigs fit in really well. So I rec recommend reading Tree Crop by J. Russell Smith, the long term inspiration for it. I'd recommend reading the Permaculture Designer's Manual by Mill Mollison. Go right back to the source to do some design considerations with this. And um, uh a rec restoration agriculture, how, how I did it. Those three right there will get you a picture of what I'm doing. Um, and then if you really want to get right down to it and if you feel that you have to own land, um, start taking like real estate courses, get rich quick, you know, no money down real estate courses to, cause that, that part of it right there is, is, uh, is critical or start working with the Savannah Institute and checking out some of their long-term lease agreements and perhaps get some connections through them. So you set up a long-term lease on a farm. I know that they work with dozens of people who are even older than me that have set up these perennial polyculture systems, and they would love to have some young people come in and farm that property. Problem that you will encounter as a farmer, whether you're old or young, is you will be required some days to get up before dawn. You will be required some days to work when it's freezing rain and you have holes in your boots. You'll be required some days to stay out past midnight with a flashlight on your head trying to find that calf that's down before the coyotes get them. You know, there's, it's, uh, it's a, a lot of work, a lot of uh, seasonally crazy work, uh, and the pay sucks. So um, I think that's probably a, a good summary of it all, those resources, and uh, that's what you can expect on the job. But, I mean, come on, look at this picture right here. What a blast it is. What a beautiful, beautiful place I get to live in. I eat some of the most incredible food in the world, and I meet some really, really wonderful people. And uh, to, to be awakened by the birds in the morning and uh, sung to sleep by crickets and frogs is just incredible. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'll just put in a, another plug for the Savannah Institute. Of course, we have um, uh, you, you know, a good place to start is on our website. That's savannahinstitute.org. Um, we just came out with a planting tree crops book, and so it's a really easy to read how to how to get started in in this whole agroforestry world. Um, so definitely check that out. There's a free PDF on the website, or you can get a hard copy, um, and so many other resources and links to other websites. We've got the um, uh, perennial farm map. Uh, website that where you can find folks in your area and connect with other people doing similar things and learn from each other. Um, so just a ton, a ton. Start at the website and, and be in contact with any of us um, if you want to know more or get involved or host a field day or attend a field day or whatever. There's so much yeah. going on. And to all all the participants, you know, my support uh, of the Savannah Institute is not fake because they let me do a webinar here i mean this is this is the first real deal on the block is the savannah institute so you guys are at the right place you're on the right path <laughs> well thanks a lot 
Um, yeah, well, with that, I don't see any other questions coming in. So any final words from you, Mark, before we sign off? Um, actually, you know what I'm going to do? Uh, not final words from me, but why don't I do this? I might take a little bit. Uh, dum -dum -dum. And then what you'll do is you'll listen to this for a little bit. And then, come on, go. Wait. Thanks for joining, everybody. We'll see you next time.